Hello everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to our King's Expert Series webinar. Today I'm joined by our, by our King's Experts and I'm very happy to introduce my colleagues from across the university. So I'm going to jump straight in and introduce our chair for the afternoon, Dr. Rajan Basra. Please do remember that you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, so do note them down and we'll be taking them later. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Rajan Basra. I'm going to be the host and moderator for this session. I'm actually uh, a researcher myself here at King's. I've done a master's, a PhD, and now staying on for a postdoc here, so the university just can't seem to get rid of me. Uh, I'm joined by three of my colleagues, and we all work together at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization, where our focus is on extremism, terrorism, and what we can do to perhaps counter these uh, phenomena. So I'm going to pass it over now to my colleague, uh, Nicola, uh, to briefly introduce yourself before passing it along to uh, Nafis and to Hannah. Thank you, Rajan. Hi, everybody. My name is Nicola. I am the research director of the Global Network on Extremism and Technology. So we're a special project within ICSR, and we're actually the independent uh, academic arm of the Global Internet Forum for Countering Terrorism. So we have a very interesting role within ICSR. And one of the great benefits of the things that we do, and we can discuss more, is uh, we really produce very quick research into current trends within violent extremism online, and also the more in-depth research that you would normally expect from an academic body. So that's the work we do on our side of the ICSR table. And I'll pass it to Nafis. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nafis Samid. I'm the Research and Policy Director for EXCEPT. EXCEPT is an FCDO-funded project. Um, it's a very large project um, looking at violent and peaceful behavior. In fact, it's the largest project in the history of the War Studies Department. And we have a very multidisciplinary team of psychologists and social scientists, historians, clinicians, and we just want to understand sort of what are the pathways to peace and violence. And we have a variety of ways of addressing that through longitudinal surveys, experimental design, qualitative interviews, randomized control trial studies. We look at a variety of themes from trauma and mental health to gender, memory, and conflict, trust in institutions. We look at armed actors as well as civilians. And we also do work in prisons, which is actually headed by Dr. Basra, actually. And so, yeah, that's Accept, and I'll pass it on to Hannah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hannah Rose. I'm a research fellow at ICSR, and I'm also a PhD student here in the Department of War Studies. My PhD mainly looks at anti-Semitism on the far right, but for ICSR, what I've been really interested in over the past couple of years is the increasing number of young people and teenagers that are involved in far-right extremism and terrorism. So I'm looking forward to sharing a bit of that research with you today. All right, super. So there you have, we've got three researchers. We've got Nicola that focuses on extremism uh, and technology. We've got Nafis that is doing this multidisciplinary project looking at how people become violent or become peaceful. And then we've got Hannah, which is who's focusing on youth radicalization. What I'll do now is dive into each researcher's themes and work in a little bit more detail, and I'll encourage you all to ask any questions that you've got in the chat, and then we'll go through those uh, as well. So Nicola, I suppose first and foremost, you're working on this project, the GNET project, that looks at extremism and technology. So can you tell us more about what this involves, how it came about, what's the actual work that you're doing, and so on? Of course I can. So GNET is interesting in that it sits within it. It is funded and supported by an NGO. So we are an independent side of GIVCT, which is the Global Internet Forum for Counting Terrorism. And they were actually founded by big tech companies who were looking to address extremism on their platforms and looking for ways in which they could work together to counter this problem. Uh, so they were founded in 2017 and really came to prominence in 2019 after the Christchurch shooting where 
it was shown that efforts really needed to be stepped up after the attacks were live streamed and widely viewed as well. So that's where we've come from. Um, and that puts us in a very interesting dynamic within, so there are kind of three points to us as GIF CT, who works directly with the tech companies. There's us as the independent academic arm. And then we also have tech against terrorism, which are the data scientists who directly work with as tech companies and with websites and anyone who deals with big data and are at risk of being exploited by extremists and terrorists online to put in measures to prevent that exploitation. So in that regard, we're a three-prong approach to, to a problem, uh, which I think is quite unique. And that, that's how we came to be. Super. You, you mentioned that it arose after the Christchurch uh, attack in 2019. And I remember seeing this on the news at the time. Many people in the audience will, would remember this too. It was really shocking. And I'm wondering if you could speak about what work GNET has done to help counter that specific threat, because this was the first time that anyone had live streamed a terrorist attack, right? Even though people had been maybe anticipating it for several years. So can you tell me a bit more about what was done in the aftermath of that, that attack? I can. So this is, this is really GIF-CT's, um, I'll talk about the GIF-CT side of the story because that leads into our side of the story. And so after the Christchurch attack, there was a Christchurch call for action, uh, which GIF-CT was the leader in, uh, in terms of, arming tech companies with the means of removing content quickly after it was identified online and sharing it between them. So they have a, a technique called hashing where they get the digital fingerprint of extremist content online and share it among the platforms so it can be quickly and readily removed. And so that is, uh, they've got an incident protocol. So after attack, if anything does come online, they have a process and procedure to remove it how effective that always is in removing terrorist content and extremist content online is also is always a very difficult thing. And so from the GNET side, we both look at trends on how extremist content is viewed online, especially because a lot of what we consider extremist isn't necessarily illegal content. So if you think about hate speech and racism online, which many of us would consider extreme, that often falls be below thresholds of illegal or extremist content according to social media policies. So a lot of the research we do looks and a lot of the discussions we have are looking at aligning those two ideas of how do you prevent extremist content becoming mainstream online, which is a huge problem with the rise of the far right and the increasing amount of extremist material online. Uh, but also how do you manage, observe those trends and make sure we know exactly what's happening, what to look out for. And so the role that GNET plays is we have this universe of contributors who have exceptional expertise and case knowledge. So whereas a tech company might not know everything there is to know about a particular extremist group, there are researchers who have spent years and years and years following these trends. And so we're able to have those researchers uh, put, produce that and publish with us. And then tech companies can take that specific information and add it to their knowledge pile of how to counter the, that material online. So we're the specialists in, in these terrifying extremist groups quite often, but we have the expertise to provide that really granular, granular knowledge to tech companies, as well as a, in a research capacity. And not to be uh, too immodest here, I, I think it's really uh, impressive that King sits at the heart of it. Because as academics, I think uh, often you fear just being this very obscure academic that doesn't have very much real world impact. So you're not being, your work is not being read, it's not being shared by the people that really matter. But this project, it seems like Gina is part of dealing with policymakers and dealing with uh, people in the tech industry as well, right? Absolutely. And we have publications that we produce two to three times a week called Insights. And what they are are academic commentaries on current trends or analysing recent attacks. So we can actually turn around that information really quickly. So whereas academic processes, if anyone's ever tried to publish a journal article or a book, can take years. And so 
while they're really rich in empirical data and really important for theory building and understanding how the world works, you also need that fast reaction time to things that are happening in the world. And GNET really allows that to happen. Mm. I imagine uh, you'll soon have a GNET insight about the, uh, the attack at the, uh, the migrant center because the online digital footprint of the attacker who threw the petrol bombs has just been discovered this afternoon. So my colleagues are, as we speak, going through that material, looking to analyze what sort of narratives the attacker engaged with and so on. So that's something that we can push out and it's something that is really on the, on the cutting edge, you know, doing that within 24 hours of, uh, of the news being released. And not to toot Hannah's form too hard, but uh, she did produce in the aftermath of the Bratislava attack, we, she was able to analyze the content that was in the manifesto and from the online social media presence of the attacker and produce an insight in under 48 hours and have that published online and available. So that's the kind of turnaround we can do in these major events. And Nicola, I just want to go back to this example of, of live stream terrorist attack because there was one recently in, uh, in Buffalo, in New York, and the attacker tried to live stream it but didn't complete the live stream and it wasn't shared as widely. So what role did uh, GIFCT have to play in this hashing of the videos that you speak about? What role did that play then in, uh, in stopping the spread of the video of that attack? So what GIFCT can do from a tech side, which I am not the tech side, so this is my very basic explanation of what they do. So while each platform can individually remove content that's posted online, there's always what it could be, you could post something to a link on a different platform, which would avoid the content moderation process of a lot of online, uh, of on, on, uh, online services. But what the hashing does is get that digital footprint, the original address of where these videos and this content comes from, and are able to share it rapidly and then take it down rapidly because it's all coming from that singular source. So rather than just addressing individual posts, it's looking for the digital footprint of that material. And that's really the difference. And that's, I mean, you can look at the statistics of GIFCT and Tech Against Terrorism as to how much content they take down and how quickly they're able to do it. And there are always spaces to improve on content moderation. Tech companies can always improve and do better. But that particular process in response to attacks is, is proving to be quite effective. And just a final question for me, Nicola, uh, before I switch to Nafis. So hash of uh, a video is made, so if someone tries to re-upload that onto you know, a platform like YouTube or Twitter or Facebook, it will be taken down. What if they maybe modify the video? Would that then mean that a new hash needs to be created to identify that video? I think it depends, again, you're pushing my tech knowledge, but uh, I think it depends on how much has changed and whether it's just a re-upload of the same material, but yeah, they, they have the capacity to do that again. They have a capacity to really rapidly identify that material and share that information, so. Okay. Yeah, I imagine it's always gonna be a slight game of cat and mouse when it comes to taking down this content online and extremists will kind of adapt their behavior uh, in response to the moderation policies of these platforms. But we can park that discussion for now. I know some questions have already come in related to this, but we'll just address this after I've spoken with Nafis and with Hannah. So with that said, Nafis, you're working, and I'm actually working on the same project as you, called Accept. If you can give us a bit more detail of what you've got planned with this project. That would be Yes, like I said, it's a very large scale project. And I mean, really, the only constraints are we're looking at why people either engage in peaceful behavior or violent behavior. And we're we're looking at um, countries that are considered fragile or conflict affected. Uh, so right now, most of our fa focus is in the MENA, so like the Middle East, North Africa, as well as the Sahel regions. Um, we have our three biggest projects going on in Syria, Iraq, and South Sudan, but we have satellite projects that you worked on, uh, Rajan, in, uh, in Lebanon. We have other projects going on in Turkey. We might be opening up to Afghanistan soon. Um, and so 
the the idea is that clearly there's there there's huge systemic issues that are taking place in these fragile and conflict affected areas right you have basically you know institutions collapsing and even when they're not collapsing you have trust in the institutions collapsing uh, people these are diverse societies and oftentimes people will start to look at some of these societal look at some of these institutions as beholden to one particular member of, of of society over another so you have conspiracy theories also emerging as well you have misinformation and disinformation you have a lot of the stuff we even see in west in the west social fragmentation and polarization taking place but of course it's under much more dire circumstances you have people who are who are idps internally displaced people you have refugees living in other countries people who have had their entire home stripped of them and people who are suffering from from, from severe uh, PTSD, uh, repeated PTSD, which turns into something called complex PTSD. You have all sorts of mental health issues that are emerging in some of these areas, from anxiety to depression, to even what are called dark triad, which is like things like Machiavellianism, psychopathy, sadism. And so most of the research on, especially on like the mental health side of things, we know that conflict and war and so forth can create trauma and can create mental health issues. One of the hypotheses that we have is that unhealed trauma and untreated mental health issues can then encourage people to get involved in violent conflict. So therefore, it, it creates this sort of circle of violence that continues again and again. And that's something that, you know, maybe some people see it as, as, as very likely, but there's actually very little solid research to show that that actually is the case. Um, most of it is anecdotal or methodologically, it's just scientifically weak research. Um, as you know, Rajan, I mean, the, I mean, the, the field of, of terrorism research is not known for its high methodological rigor. Um, it's, it's a young field. Most of the research has come out uh, since 1969. And actually, between 1969 and 2001, until 9-11, 90% of the research that was out there was based just on literature review. So only about 10% was based on any sort of actual primary data collection whatsoever. Uh, and then after 9-11, you start having some, some primary data collection. But you know, only recently, the most recent meta-analysis of the last seven or eight years of research shows it's just about 53% of actually all of the literature, all the literature and terrorism is based on primary data. So a lot of it is still based on literature review. And part of that is it's hard to get access to this data. You know, it's hard to get access to terrorists and militant groups. And it takes a long time to build up some of these dat databases and to make them open access and for different researchers to share their data for these larger databases to get created. It takes a long time for psychologists to develop psychometric uh, instruments that allow you to detect things like susceptibility to radicalization that requires multiple validations of these instruments for them to become even useful things that you can put in something like a survey. Funding resources didn't really start opening up until after 9-11. And so, you know, we're we're kind of now finally at a place where some of the database research is building up, but also now a lot of the tools and instruments and funding that we have are, are at the point where we can start to actually do really methodologically rigorous research. It's still not happening a lot, though, if I'm if I'm being 100% honest. You know, we're we're one of the few teams probably in the world that's actually doing longitudinal psychometric survey studies with randomized control trials being held in between. We're going to potentially layer brain scan research on top of that, epigenetic research on top of that. This kind of scientific rigorous research is just, it's it's hard to find. We're one of the very few teams in the world. And for this particular project, we're, as far as I know, the only team in the world that's doing it. Mm. So, you say you're doing this research in uh, primarily in these three countries, in Iraq, Syria, and South Sudan, and you're going to be uh, asking questions related to people's experience of conflict. But I'm wondering if you could speak more about who will you actually be interviewing? What are the research populations you're dealing with? Well, so it's a mixture. Uh, so this part of it is kind of civilians. So we're just trying to get as wide of a distribution as we possibly can in, in these different countries. Um, in Iraq specifically, we're trying to get uh, as wide of a distribution, you know, Shia Arabs, Sunni Arabs, Kurds, Yazidis, Shabak, Christians, as many different kinds of ethnic groups, minority groups that we can get access to. 
Um, in South Sudan, it's it's much more difficult to get access to. It's just it's just very dangerous to get in there to to, to collect the data. So we're focusing on a smaller number of ethnic groups like the Dinka, the Nuer, um, the Taposa population. But we might potentially be going into Ethiopia and Uganda to to access a broader spectrum of of ethnic groups as well. In Syria, we're still sort of figuring out all the different, you know, groups that we can potentially get access to. Some of them, some regions we won't be able to enter in at all. But it's not just the civilian groups themselves. I mean, we're also trying to interview armed actors, the people who are actually involved in some of the, in, in, in perpetrating, in perpetrating some of these um crimes. So uh, some of them can be militant group members. Some of them can be, I mean, people like you interviewed in, 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 in prison, you know, people who were at one point at least involved in actual extremist militant organizations or people who had been, who had been victims of them, you know, family members of people who had been kidnapped. That's, you know, the people that you were interviewing in, in Lebanon. Potentially when we get access to Afghanistan, we're going to try to get interviews directly with the Taliban themselves, actually. Yeah, and if I could speak as someone actually involved in this work, I, I do think it's really important that researchers like this team at King's that we speak with the people that often aren't heard from when it comes to their views and their experiences of conflict. So Nafis mentioned, but recently I was out in Lebanon, been there three times this year, uh, and I was interviewing people who were in prison for terrorism offenses. Now, some of them uh, had fought in Syria for groups like uh, Islamic State, Others had been involved with jihadist movements in Lebanon itself. And amazingly, no one had really asked them on a systematic way what their experience in prison was like. You know, what's the day-to-day -day routine like? How are the prison wings controlled by ISIS, for instance? And so we've been hoovering up all of that data and a team here at King's are now going through that, looking to identify what kind of themes are consistent across the different uh, responses that we've got. Just one thing, uh, Nafis, you mentioned something about brain scans. I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us more. What does that work involve and how does that relate to uh, studying conflict and, uh, and extremism? Yeah, so there's this, there's, there's this historically, I think another reason why psychology and neuroscience and cognitive science were not particularly involved in terrorism research is that there is this I think, you know, a very understandable instinct uh, to not want to pathologize people who join these groups, right? So in the beginning, that's exactly what everybody was doing. You know, in, in the 60s and 70s, if someone was a terrorist, they must be crazy. And there was an attempt to find what's wrong with them and, and, and why they're crazy. Then there was a pushback against that showing, well, no, they're not. And they're, they're pretty normal people, pretty functioning members of society oftentimes. And so there was a tendency to say, you know, maybe society is sick, maybe not the individual person is sick, the circumstances that they're in is sick. And that's that's more important. And that's what we should be focusing on. And so there was a heavy emphasis on that. But clearly, like anything, you know, you try to just most things, most of the time, the truth is somewhere in the middle. And there is oftentimes mental health issues. And there may be some sort of at least genetic or epigenetic predispositions that may create more appetite for aggression or or the, 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 there's a variety of effects that it can have on someone's psychology, including uncertainty and tolerance and so forth. Um, and so, you know, neuroscience has been kind of one of these things that is sort of the spooky thing. Like, you know, do, do you want to scan the brains of, of extremists? Do you think that you're going to find a terrorist part of the brain? Um, I was I was part of the, the research team that conducted the first ever brain scan studies of, of members of uh, supporters of extremist organizations, jihadi groups. And uh, yeah, I can I can tell you we didn't find any terrorist part of the brain. Uh, I, and uh, and we weren't really looking for it. There was nothing structurally wrong with them. There was uh, our our sample didn't have any neuropsychiatric disorders. They had normal IQs, normal personality distributions. But yeah, it took me you know a few years in the field to build up trust and relationships with these people, and then to convince them to get their brains scanned, which was its own interesting and unique process, which was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be, to be honest. They, they, they really thought that their brains were something special, and they were very happy to to let me as a scientist just marvel at the glory of their special brains uh so we were able to get them in a brain scanner and you know again largely the stuff that we found was that it's these social dynamics these social factors that can either push someone closer to the edge of violence or, or pull them away from it we found people at the early stages of radicalization when we experimentally manipulated them to feel socially excluded areas of the brain that's associated with their sacred values 
um, started to activate even for values that are not sacred. That means values that have some importance, but not that much importance. When they feel socially excluded, they increase the importance of those values. They increase their willingness to fight and die for them. That's largely because when someone's at an early stage of radicalization, they usually have a foot in multiple identities. And when they feel excluded by one, they tend to move very quickly into the oppositional identity that, that posits itself, that frames itself as, as being the defenders of the people who are being marginalized by one of their identity groups. So they very quickly exponentially radicalize, actually. And then we found for people who were at a very high level of radicalization, these Lashkari Taiba supporters, which is an affiliate of Al-Qaeda, that to pull them back from the edge of violence, all we needed to do was just convince them that their broader peer group, just other Pakistani people, not other extremists, didn't agree with their willingness to, to fight and die. And we found areas of the brain that were otherwise offline, which has to do with emotional regulation and self-control, came rushing back online as soon as they found out they were out of step with their community and quickly suppressed more emotional centers of the brain and lowered their willingness to fight and die. Now, this only works because they still, on some level, even though they were full extremists, identified still with the broader Pakistani population. And luckily, that was able to act as an inroad into their psychology, into their brain, to reduce their willingness to fight and die. However, terrorist groups are kind of implicitly aware of this, and that's why they try to do everything they can to sequester their members, to cut off all social ties between them and the rest of society so they have no, no inroads from outside groups whatsoever, which is why it's so important when we have friends or family members, whether they're joining a cult or a conspiracist group or an extremist group, while we may want to cut ties off with them because we're so disappointed, actually maintaining those social bonds are so crucial because oftentimes that's the only bridge that that person has to outside norms and values. And maybe you can be the only person at a crucial moment to pull them back from the edge of violence. Mm. This uh, reminds me of the uh, instance of suicide bombers in Iraq during the uh, American-led uh, coalition occupation of the country. Uh, and the story goes that uh, uh, many of Zarqawi's men were actually uh, uh, trained uh, very intensively outside of Iraq shipped into the country and pretty much the first time they ever met an Iraqi was when they were about to detonate the suicide bomb. So it's that restriction of social interactions with the different communities and this one in this case communities you're targeting has been very effective in terrorist uh, movements. I'll just bring in also like a, a gendered example into that. So, for example, in Palestine, there was this, this research showing that, you know, male suicide bombers who would go into Israel were much more like on, on a scale of like five times much more likely to detonate their explosives than female suicide bombers. And people's initial reaction to that was, ah, oh, you know, women, they're, they're the softer sex. They have, you know, more empathy when they're there. They can't really pull the trigger. That's not actually, there was, there was further research done into that. And what they found out is that men, because of the way Palestinian society is and the social norms, before the men would go in and carry out the attacks, they were able to put them into safe houses for at least a month where they completely controlled all the information that was going in and out of that home before putting them out to carry out an attack. For women, that's much harder to do because they're living with their husbands or they're, or they're with their family. It's harder to get women into those homes and separated from the rest of their community. But they were able to do it for some of the women. And when you compare the women who were in some of those safe houses to the men who were in those safe houses, you have the same rate of suicide detonation. Mm -hmm. And the men and the women who were not in those homes, it was the same rate of not doing it. That's very interesting. Just one final question for you, Nafis, before I come over to, uh, to Hannah. So you're doing this more cutting edge uh, brain scans uh, out in the field, but I imagine you'll be supplementing this with much more traditional techniques like semi-structured interviews or taking oral histories, just recording the life stories of the people involved. So that's the kind of uh, methods you'll be using, but what, can you give an idea of some of the questions uh, you'll be asking them? On, on the qualitative side or both? Well, a little bit of both would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, part of it is we want to know about some of their conflict experiences. We want to know about the, whether they, they have experienced trauma during the conflict. We want to know about their adverse childhood experiences. We want to know about their mental health and depressive symptoms. But we also want to know about their, their, their desire for peace and reconciliation, their willingness to forgive people who have hurt them in the past. We want to know about their trust in institutions. We want to know about their, uh, their, their identity. Um, we want to know, you know, on the quantitative side, we're finding out how to how to put like a number to all of these different factors, essentially, right? We have these validated questionnaires, and we can ultimately create a single construct. 
but even if we're able to come up with a single construct of vengefulness or of, or of or of moral injury or of whatever, it's difficult to know exactly what that number means from person to person. And that's exactly where the qualitative interviews come in, because then we ask people open-ended questions. You know, we'll ask them about, about you know, what was their experience like in conflict? What was their upbringing like? Um, how do they feel now as a member of society? When they think about a particular group, what feelings come up to them? And so then we can actually start to take that number that maybe will tell us what the relationship is between factor X and factor Y and whether one is causing the other factor to then understand at a much more contextual and nuanced level what those factors actually mean person to person, whether it's different generationally. Is it different between men and women? Is it different between people living in urban environments versus rural environments? Are there differences between people living in different socioeconomic statuses? And so then we can actually break down and get into much more nitty gritty detail of what some of these more quantitative findings are telling us. And the feast, uh, say I'm looking forward to seeing how this project progresses, but. I'm on the project myself, so there, <laughs> there you have it. So You'll get a front row seat. Yeah, exactly. So we'll finally just come on to you, uh, you, Hannah, and then we'll open it up to some of the audience uh, questions that we've got. So you're working on this issue of youth radicalization. I'm wondering if you could tell us more about that. Yeah, exactly. So um, what we've noticed over the past couple of years is a really significant increase in the number of children, uh, minors, but also young people, university age people involved in extremist movements um, and terrorist movements. To give you some context in the UK, from kind of mid 2020 to mid 2021, the number of minors arrested for terrorism offences tripled. And that's continued to rise since then. It's something that the former Met Police Commissioner, Cresta Dick, called a new generation of extremists. So we've seen a lot of this in the media um, when young people have been arrested or, or convicted of terrorism offences, but not much analysis beyond they're young. And one thing that's come up quite a lot and is quite frustrating to read is this, what we've called a grooming narrative. So this idea which um, people inherently have that if a young person is convicted or has um, committed an, a, an extremist act, they must have been groomed online by some kind of shadowy older figure um, or a groomer that has um, influenced them and they didn't know what they were doing, they didn't really have any part to play. And what we found is, although that's still true in some cases, it's not necessarily all the time. So last December, I published some research with the Community Security Trust, who are a charity in the UK that look at specifically anti-Semitism, but um, lots of forms of violent extremism and terrorism. And we looked into 10 racial nationalists groups and networks across Western Europe. All of these groups and networks have been created since 2018 and had an average age of under 25. And what we saw, and it's quite similar to Nafisa's point about socialization and social ties, is that these young people increasingly independent of older people were able to influence each other, recruit each other, finance their own extremist activities, create their own propaganda and fuel their own extremist movements. Why does this impact us? Well, we have this, I think, idea of how older adults should be treated in the criminal justice system, and we can't necessarily implant those same, not only punishments, uh, but also rehabilitation techniques to younger people. So one of our findings is that we really need to have a rethink about how we look at the issue of children's agency when it comes to violent extremism, and also then how we counteract that. So that's something that I'm starting to also look at with my colleague, Dr. Gina Vale at the University of Southampton. Um, across the political spectrum, what is a child extremist? What is a child terrorist? What do we understand them to be in our, in our legal system? I guess to add on to something that's already been mentioned, why does this matter day to day? Well, we saw a couple of weeks ago a terrorist attack in Bratislava, um, where a young person who was 19 um, was committed an attack outside an LGBTQ bar um, in Slovakia. 
His manifesto, which he posted online, directly references an attack earlier in the year by an 18 year old in Buffalo, which is an area of um, the states which it has a high Afro African American population. And this is also seen as a terrorist attack um, on the on the black community there. So we know that young people, 18, 19 year olds, these are people who would have been radicalized as minors. Um, are increasingly able to influence each other and to commit the same types of attacks and have the same impact on the wider population as their older older peers, older contemporaries. Yeah, something I found really alarming just looking at the news recently, you've seen young teenagers, people who are 13, 14 years old, arrested for terrorism offences. And this is something that's really unprecedented. I wonder, something that immediately comes to mind is, is this strictly an online thing or do you see uh, groups offline in the real world, so to speak, also targeting people or being involved with uh, young teenagers in that way? It's a really good question. I think in, in terrorism studies, we talk a lot about uh, the post-organizational far right. So this idea that there's no longer formal groups with a head and everyone pays fees and everyone goes to the meetings. Everyone, it's more on these kind of online milieus through different um, networks and forums. However, that's not exclusively the case. And it's the same for this online offline um, differentiation. Uh, we do see, and in my report last December, we found these groups going on hikes, um, performing acts of community service, doing banner drops, um, holding rallies for their causes. Um, what and there was a particularly interesting article actually I think in last the last edition of terrorism and political violence about actually the difference between online and offline is more and more blurry because well how do we know they've committed these offline activities because they record them and put them on their telegram channels for example on their social media accounts so actually the way in which young people increasingly communicate is almost an integrated online offline environment these young people remember and this seems quite an obvious point to make of what has been termed digital natives. There's no kind of transition into how we use social media. These young people grew up in these spaces and we're just for the first time seeing what the impact of that is on young extremism and how they engage with politics and society. Okay, um, thank you, uh, uh, Hannah. I'm now gonna open it up to some of the questions that we've got from the, uh, from the audience. And I'm expecting good questions because you're all alumni of King's, right? The first one that we've got uh, comes from Tim Malone and he's asking, uh, I suppose, to you, Nicola, even with the digital footprint of an extremist event, how can you remove it from online platforms without the cooperation, the global cooperation of every tech company that hosts online content? So I suppose, are we just talking about the major platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or are we talking about smaller platforms as well? Thank you, Rajan, and thank you, Tim. Uh, this is a very interesting question uh, and one that we will possibly never outrun. So we'll see as groups are deplatformed, they move to smaller platforms and those smaller platforms are less well regulated and have less of an incentive to remove extremist content online. And we've seen that a lot with the deplatforming of extremist actors on the major social media groups. Now, not everyone who participates is a big group. Now, of course, we do, the major companies are members of GIFCT, are funders of GIFCT. And so the big ones are doing the work. But then we also have some smaller companies that should have just a few staff members who stumble into extremism being on their website that they would have never expected. And the one that I think is very interesting is Airbnb. So if you're extremists want to host a, a lovely retreat at your holiday location, uh, something you would have never have thought when you were putting together an accommodation website that perhaps extremists will use your services, right? And so the more we deplatform actors, the more they find new and imaginative spaces to participate. But in saying that, one of the things that's really important is trying to prevent this material becoming mainstream. 
And there is an increasing mainstream of extremist material online. We do know that approximately a third of people uh, have experienced, have say that they have seen extremist material online or someone they know has seen extremist material online. So as much as you do want to get everything offline, what you really don't want to want to happen is for this extremist content to become mainstream. And I think that's when you're when you can only be reactive to content that's uploaded, perhaps that is a realistic goal rather than removing everything. Okay. I've got another question for you, Nicola, from from Hannah Bentley. Uh, asking, if a manifest or document is edited in a minor way, for example, by adding a punctuation mark, would that bypass the hash created to be able to avoid detection by website moderators? And, and this question from Hannah kind of reminds me of efforts that uh, Islamic State supporters would take online. If you've ever seen an Islamic State video, in the corner would appear their flag. And so once Jihadi supporters realized that that material was being taken down immediately. They posted it up again, but with the flag blurred out in the corner. And so companies had to react uh, to this sort of innovation in how uh, extremist supporters are uploading material. But Nicola, I wonder then, how, what would you say to Hannah's question about editing documents in a minor way? I would say, I wish I was tech against terrorism so I could provide you a very definite answer. So Hannah, I'm not sure off the top of my head, I would say that text-based documents are much easier than video and images to capture because they can do a search for the words and they don't have to be perfect. Um, so they can probably use their algorithms in that way to pick that up. But Rajan makes an excellent point about the cat and mouse game of terrorist actors uploading content. There are now ISIS videos where they show the film in a video backwards, like in a mirror, in a fake mirror, or they just scribble out the logos and scribble out particular identifying features that were the reason it got taken down in the first place. So if you want to remove all terrorist content online, first you've got to stop it from being produced in the first place. Um, but then obviously you, if you want to stop terrorist content, you have to stop it being produced by the person in the first place. It can't just be a response mechanism by tech companies to take it down. It has to be a much more multi-layered, multi-actor strategy for prevention. Okay. Just another question for you, Nicola, not to hog your time, uh, but this has come from Annie, who's asking uh, about AI and the use of this technology to counter uh, extremist content. So she says, you mentioned tech is used to recognize trends and patterns. And the ideal approach seems to be to trace the digital footprint back to the source. Can or has AI contributed to effectively predicting patterns of extremist activity proactively before a source has been identified? Yeah, so I know that algorithms are one of the main preventative tools that tech companies do use. AI obviously is something that is growing and developing and works in all kinds of ways. So AI, you have to train to look for the right things and some AI is better than others. Uh, firstly, AI has a huge white English bias. So it will be much better at picking up content produced from white English speaking actors than it will be um, picking up content from other languages and people of other backgrounds. Um, there's also a lot of false positives when it comes to recognizing people of color and also uh, in different languages. For example, with Arabic, you have di diacritics, which aren't used in written form. So maybe that word means multiple things depending on the diacritic. So that makes it really hard um, for AI to pick up those differences. But people are doing work on it. It's slower work. Um, and I, I have read some AI pieces for going through, for example, Arabic texts, but it's a, it's a moving face. Okay. Thanks, Nicola. I wonder if we could uh, some questions to, to Nifri. So someone has asked um, uh, you, Nifis, are you considering a PET brain scans on terrorist groups in which researchers can interact with, or, um, sorry, lost the question in the chat. Let me just bring this up again. Bear with me one moment. Excuse me, right here. 
Sorry, yes. Are you considering PET brain scans on terrorist groups in which researchers can actually interact with or question the terrorists while scanning and see the different brain areas activate? So what we've done before is it's called fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. So many of us have had MRIs done, you know, when you break a bone or something, imagine uh, an MRI as a picture and think of fMRI as film. So it's a bunch of pictures being taken very quickly and it's looking at something called blood oxygenation level diffusion, bold activity, which just means that where's the blood rushing to in the brain? And then you can kind of pinpoint what areas of the brain are active at what particular moment. And you can even do experimental manipulations in there. You can show them visual stimuli. You can have them play video games in there. You can have them make decisions. You can do an experimental manipulation before they get in the scanner and see what happens when they're in the scanner and compare them to a control group. So we've done that and we're gonna be open to doing that. The one that I'm most interested in, 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 you, in, in playing around with is actually something called tran transmagnetic cranial stimulation. It's like a little wand that you can wave over someone's brain and it actually can shut down parts of their brain or it can activate parts of their brain. So most neuroimaging research, neuroscience research is just kind of correlational. You're just, you're, you're seeing what parts of the brain activate when they're doing task A or task B. This one, you can actually clearly see what the cause effect relationship is. Cause you can say, I'm taking this part of the brain off the table. It's just going to sleep for a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds, as long as I'm waving it over your head. And to see how that affects your decision making, right? I can overactivate it as well, overstimulate it to see do you become more aggressive, more violent, more hateful. Um, a lot of that research actually has been done on just normal forms of aggression um, and, 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 and stimulating parts of the brain or, or, or deactivating them. But it hasn't been done really on ideological violence or ideological aggression, you know, these people aren't just expressing aggression because they just have so much hate in their heart and they're just, it's just pure violence. It's, it's very ideologically moderated, right? Who they're upset by, why they're upset at them, why is that moral outrage getting created? Why do they feel this sense of injustice? And so that's something that I hope to be able to do is eventually uh, shut off and increase the activation of terrorist brains. Mm -hmm. that, that would be quite something. Another question has come through from someone who's anonymous in the crowd. They've, they're asking, uh, how would you actually go about proving the causal relationship between these different factors that you're looking at and proclivity for violence and radicalization? How can you show that this factor actually has an impact? Well, I want to call out a term that was used there that I don't agree with, which is proving. We don't <laughs> prove. Science doesn't prove. Uh, we, we, that's for mathematicians to do. Um, and that goes for much of the hard sciences as well. Um, what we do is we increase our confidence in a causal relationship based off the quality of the evidence. And so one thing that you can do is um, experimental design. It's a pretty classical example where you have a control group, you have an experimental group, you manipulate things for the experimental group, and you see the effect that it has on certain outcome measures. So as I mentioned, for this study, we're doing three large-scale uh, randomized controlled trial studies. So particularly one of the hypotheses that we have is if you can reduce people's trauma-related distress then you can lower their um, markers of violent uh, propensity or violent conflict propensity. And those markers can be how much vengeance you want on the outgroup, how much you explicitly say you support certain extremist groups, how much you how much um, how much you're willing to forgive uh, the the outgroup, how much you see the outgroup as part of your identity. Um, and how much punishment and how much willingness to reconcile So you, uh, without group members. So you have all these different markers uh, for measuring someone's various attitudes towards violent conflict. And then what we're doing is we're taking hundreds of these people in Syria, in Iraq, in South Sudan, and we're, put, and we're randomly selecting them to participate in about a five-week mental health intervention um, that is a mixture of kind of mindfulness exercises, somatic exercises, narrative exposure therapy, all social capital building, all for the purposes of actually lowering this, their distress. And then we have hundreds of other people who are a control group who, who will be also measuring before and after, but who won't be participating in the actual trial. And if our hypothesis is right, then we should be able to see a clear divergence between our control group and our experimental group which will give us confidence, won't prove, 
anything because we don't we're not in the business of proofs, but we're in the business of increasing confidence in that causal inference. Okay, Nafi. So look forward to having more confidence in the in the results. Um, Hannah, we've got several questions come through related to young people getting involved in extremism. I can see that you know people are really concerned about this issue. One question that's come through from from Tim Malone again. He's saying, well, maybe it could be just that more are being caught and brought before the justice system. So he's asking, are more young people actually now involved in extremism or are just more being caught? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's something we're asking ourselves as well. Um, I suspect it's a bit of both. Um, of course, we only have the statistics that we're going off. Um, so it's difficult to actually um, interpret those in, you know, we're trying to interpret them in the most useful way. Uh, however, we do know that young people are increasingly online. And when we look at these online spaces, we can see that young people are increasingly involved with the creation of new, new more public groups and networks, networks that call themselves Gen Z oriented movements or that recruit exclusively children. We can kind of evidence that there is a um, higher le level of activity in young people. But of course, that's one thing that we always have to bear in mind is good point. Yeah, I, I suppose as well, when it comes to law enforcement response, when they're looking at a lot of online communities on Telegram and other platforms, they would initially be approaching it sort of age blind, if you were. Yeah. So it's only when they further investigate, then they discover that, you know, the leader of uh, one of the neo-Nazi groups was just 13 years old. You know, another one in, in Slovakia, he was just teenagers, 14 years old. It's kind of remarkable that the age is involved here. So maybe that that could help answer it in some way. Yeah, exactly. We talk about the, the kind of networks that we published our December report on. Um, we talk about them as kind of the third generation of um, national action. So for some people might remember that National Action was the first far right group to be prescribed in the UK. They were prescribed in 2016 and they were um, on average around 18 to 25. There's only been one child convicted of um, post ban association with National Action. Um, and so we can kind of um, see the spiraling of youth activism off the back of that. And also with relation to um, from the Islamist side with relation to um, children um, who traveled or attempted to travel to Syria um, was also, we can see a spike in the, the level of youth activism from that instance as well. Mm. Hannah, we've got a couple of questions here relating to incel ideology or incel. Mm. Um, so this has come from Nicholas Stevens, who's asking, what are the panel's thoughts on incel ideologies and their increasingly large online presence in the incelosphere or incel dedicated forums. Is this a significant emerging threat? Uh, and if so, what can we do to reduce or even stop this? What do you think of this, uh, Hannah? I mean, I think Rajan, you should come in on this as well because you're, you're well placed to talk about this. One trend that has been evidenced over the last few years is the rise in what the UK government classifies as mixed, unclear and unstable ideologies. So we have what we would imagine to be quite purist far right ideologies, Islamist ideologies, and then some things in between that could relate to QAnon. It could relate to this kind of um, nihilist, accelerationist milieu, school shootings, and also in many cases, um, incel ideology. Um, my assessment of it is, and having spoken to our colleague, uh, Florence Keane, who's doing her PhD in this area, is that um, there certainly is increasing awareness of this threat. And um, we have, of course, seen a rise in um, online misogyny and the kind of increasing attention that's been brought to um, the, the manosphere, as it's called. Um, in the UK, we haven't necessarily seen the level of attacks that we have in the US, for example, um, you can talk more, Rajan, about the um, Jake Davison attack and perhaps whether that was related to inceldom or not. Um, but for, for certain, there is this kind of emerging pro-violent milieu, whether that's related to what we traditionally imagine as far right or Islamist ideology is, is not always clear. Yeah, I think it's worth speaking about what happened in Plymouth. So many of you in the UK and beyond would remember the shooting that occurred in Plymouth where uh, 
a man ended up killing his own mother and then went out into the streets to kill four more people before killing himself. And emerged that he'd actually posted a lot of material online on YouTube and on Reddit relating to incel ideas. And it seems that he was somewhat involved in these ideas. He adopted these ideas. He wanted to move away from them. And so we sifted through all of his material online before it was pulled down by Reddit, by YouTube and the other platforms that he had. And what his case really shows is that it can be difficult to discern a clear motivation. Often you're seeing a mix of different personal circumstances. He had grievances with his mother, with his own living situation, you know, with the work that he was doing. And it's just his generally his station in life. And that was then mixing and interacting with this material online that says you need to hate women, you need to hate this society that we're living in, which has been shaped by feminism and so on. Uh, and it seems to be the case that he had a, a sort of a breakdown. He had an argument with his mother, shot her dead, and, and then proceeded to, to go into the streets and kill other people too. And so we're seeing this real mix then uh, of different personal factors and uh, incel ideology. But it is worth saying, and we've got a colleague here um, doing a PhD on, on the incel uh, culture online, that uh, a lot of the, the issues that people speak of in, in these communities uh, it's often related to harming themselves. So studies have been done on incels who post suicide notes online. And if you actually total up the, the numbers involved, you'll see that incels are, are just as likely, if not more likely to actually harm themselves, uh, kill themselves, uh, than kill other people. So we're seeing this kind of mixture uh, in the threat where incels are a danger to themselves, but they can also be a danger to other people as well. Uh, but it's one of these issues which is really cutting edge. Uh, and so uh, it's important that my colleague Florence Keane, is her name, uh, looks at this very closely. So for those of you interested, uh, please have a look online for more, more of Florence's, uh, Florence's work. We've got a question come from someone anonymous, which I, I will read out, which is it's quite a funny one. It's how can terrorists disguise and hide their plans on the internet? I won't get you to answer this because I suspect due to the anonymous nature, they may have other intentions uh, in mind. Another question has come through, and this is quite an interesting one because it relates to how extremism interacts with broader society. I know in the feast you're interested in polarization in society, uh, Hannah and Nicola too. The question is, how do you think the rise of far-right political parties in Europe, like we've seen in Sweden and in Italy, are normalizing extremist views? And does that have a role in inspiring radicalization in young people in particular? It's a very good question, I should say. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's something that's definitely increasingly worrying. Um, the fact that these radical right groups and movements have been brought into mainstream politics certainly normalizes one of the kind of key focus points of a lot of these uh, parties is anti-migrant and anti-Muslim rhetoric. And we've certainly seen, you know, referring to the, the question before about causation versus correlation, I don't know, but there has also been a rise in anti-Muslim hatred um, across Western Europe and in North America as well, certainly. Um, so it's it's definitely worrying. Um, I guess it remains to be seen in, in Sweden and Italy, particularly what these movements will begin to do. Um, but for a lot of society, the normalization of far right extremism is definitely something that we need to be increasingly resilient towards, particularly if our governments aren't in the same way anymore. Super. Thank you, Hannah. Nafis, I'm wondering if you could speak uh, uh, about this point before I pass it over to the alumni team. Yeah, it's a hard one because obviously they're, they're, they're getting elected because there are people who support those beliefs in the first place, right? So this creates sort of the, the chicken and egg problem, the correlation causation problem that Hannah brought up. You know, are, are, these, are, are, are these politicians and political parties responding to a change in the sentiment of the public or are they 
sort of exacerbating it. Now, there was some interesting research actually done historically on Nazi Germ Germany, on, on the effect of propaganda in Nazi Germany. So for the longest time, people always thought, you know, the Nazis radicalized the German people through their propaganda. That was just kind of a, but that was a bit of a weird, that was, that was a causal inference that was people were just making. Historians were just assuming that that was the case, that they radicalized, that the, that the party radicalized the people. But actually, more recently, uh, and some very you know, brilliant research designs came out where they had survey data where they were actually able to come up with clusters of anti-Semitism that existed in the 1930s and even before the 1930s in Germany. And they were able to actually track because the Nazis were, were very meticulous about note taking of how much propaganda they were showing in different city by city, almost neighborhood by neighborhood information. So we could actually see a correlation between the, the base rate of anti-Semitism and the propaganda and then the effect that that has on people's voting behavior. Turns out, if there wasn't you know, relatively high anti-Semitism, all the propaganda in the world didn't have any effect on people's voting behavior. Where there was historically low anti-Semitism, it actually backfired. People started voting for the other parties more as more propaganda started rushing in. Really what Nazi propaganda did, where, where it worked well, is where people already had high anti-Semitism, which unfortunately was much of the country at that point, right? So what they were doing was they were preaching to the choir, and that's what actually worked. And oftentimes, when you look at mass messaging, um, whether it's media organizations, or whether it's extremist groups, or populist groups, or whatever, far right-wing political party groups, oftentimes what they are doing is preaching to the choir. And what's kind of disturbing is to realize what a large choir actually already exists that wants to receive that message in the first place. Now, whether that applies in modern day Europe or the modern US, it's not so clear, but it should make us question some of these narratives that we have that propaganda by itself or some charismatic leader by themselves are somehow infusing radicalization into the population. Maybe they're making them, it, it may be normalizing it. Maybe they're making people realize, oh, more people feel the same way as I do and think these kind of implicit thoughts that were previously considered taboo. Well, now I can come right out and say it. But that means that they were holding it in and it was it was part of their sentiments to begin with. Yeah. Thanks, Nafis. I should say we, we've gone past our allotted time and I see we, we literally have dozens of questions that we haven't answered yet. So I do apologize for that, but I thank you for being such an engaging audience. And we're very happy to follow up with any questions that you may have. So if there's something that's really on the top of the, uh, your mind, at the tip of your tongue, feel free to reach out to either myself, Nicola, Hannah, or Nafis by email. Our emails are available on the King's website, and we'll be happy to engage with you there. I'll pass it now over back to the uh, alumni team. Thank you so much, Rajan, and thank you, Rajan, Nafis, Nicola, and Hannah for being fantastic panelists on our King's Expert Series webinar today. I can certainly um, say that the audience and our alumni community are massively engaged in this topic. We had over 140 attendees and over 40 questions in our Q&A, and it was fantastic to see the community so interested in all of your work. I personally found the webinar absolutely fascinating to listen to, and I'll certainly be reading some of the articles online myself. We will be having a follow-up email for all of our attendees today with links to further information. And as Rajan very kindly said, you can all reach them directly if you have any pressing, pressing questions. We have our next King's Expert Series webinar on the 23rd of November, which will focus on children's mental health and the lost voices of Greece, featuring Dr. Gonda Van Steen's uh, research. So now I will log off and allow you all to enjoy your evenings. Thank you all very much for joining and have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you all.